Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome APHA Executive Director Dr. Georges Benjamin, U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, and Secretary, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Julian Castro. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Let's try that again. I know you're tired. <laughs> well, the weather is nice out there. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. That's much better. You know, the National Prevention, Health Promotion, and Public Health Council is one of the crown jewels of the Affordable Care Act, particularly the prevention component. But its work is largely unknown. But it's very important. It's a national example of collaboration between um, various cabinet level agencies and the health in all policies format. Now today's session is an opportunity to better understand the work of this national asset. So with that introduction, I'd like to turn it over to our Surgeon General, Dr. Murthy. Well, thank you, Dr. Benjamin. And I also want to thank our special guest here today, Dr. Julian Castro. Uh, we're so happy that you're here with us today. Oh, I wish I was a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure your parents are plenty proud of you. <laughs> and I know all of us are too. Thank you. So I'm excited to be here with you, with you today to talk about the National Prevention Council and the National Prevention Strategy. And to all of you who may not be familiar with the, the council and the strategy, let, let me just share a, a few words about it. Uh, when I first took my post as Surgeon General, I talked about wanting to do two big things. One is to build a culture of prevention in America, and the second was to bring a focus to health equity, to ensure that the benefits of treatment and prevention were available to everyone, uh, not to just a few. And that is what we've tried to do through initiatives that we are building on walking and physical activity, on prescription opiates, and soon to come on nutrition, mental health, and emotional well-being. But two big forces that are helping us move toward that goal of a culture of prevention and health equity are the National Prevention Council and the National Prevention Strategy. In 2010, when the ACA was passed, the Prevention and Public Health Fund component of the ACA contained the infrastructure for setting up the National Prevention Council, a council that has representatives of 20 federal departments and agencies, and one of the first things the council did was to come together and create the National Prevention Strategy in 2011, which is a blueprint for how to build a prevention-based society. What has been really exciting to me about the National Prevention Council and the strategy is it really codifies something we've been talking about at HBHA about for the last few days, which is the idea of building health into all our policies. True. And having the participation of leaders like Secretary Castro and other secretaries has been vital in moving forward the objectives of the National Prevention Council. So with that, I, I want to just tell you lastly why this is so important to all of us. Because what Secretary Castro understands, what I understand, what all of us on the Council understand, is that for us this is about more than ensuring people are healthy. It's about recognizing that health is the key that opens doors of opportunity to people. And it's about ensuring that we are creating the kind of country where everyone has access to opportunity. That's what building health into all policies means to us. So I'm very happy to have Secretary Castro here because there's some exciting work that HUD has been doing when it comes to building health in all its policies. And HUD has been, uh, Secretary, a treasured member of the National Prevention Council. So I want to thank you for your, your support uh, of the Council and for all the good work you're doing. And I have a, a few questions, but I thought we could just start off with, uh, with an overview of what HUD is doing. Obviously, we know that uh, you and I have talked a bunch about initiatives that HUD is rolling out, but help everyone here understand how you think about health as it connects to housing, and help us understand what initiatives you're most proud about uh, that are coming out of HUD. Sure, and first of all, thank you very much for having me here today, uh, and you know, I commend you for all the great work that I know you're doing and, and that members of the uh, APHA are doing in communities across the United States. Um, I've been on the job about 15 months at HUD, and uh, these days we call ourselves the Department of Opportunity because we believe that housing is a very powerful uh, platform and portal to spark greater opportunity in people's lives. 
And one of those opportunities is to enjoy a great quality of life. And that starts with enjoying good health. Uh, and so for many years, HUD has been making important investments, uh, particularly uh, for people who live in public and subsidized housing. So we're speaking about millions of folks out there in the United States. Today, all told, that's about uh, just over nine and a half million people. Um, everything from investing, for instance, in lead hazard control grants uh, to try and detect issues with elevated blood lead levels and remediate housing units that have lead issues uh, to investments in remediating mold in housing units in tribal communities uh, to encouraging public housing authorities to have uh, their units go smoke free. Um, studying the link between uh, investing in supportive services, health services, and reducing costs to Medicaid and to Medicare. Um, so the way that we think about this is that, that investments in health are really a gateway to better quality of life for residents. Uh, and it's also a way to reduce costs to Medicaid, to Medicare, to health systems out there in general and local communities. And we're looking for ways that HUD can be even more supportive of your efforts, of, of other efforts, of the federal government and local communities to make that linkage. And ultimately, I think, um, to impress upon policymakers in Congress about this linkage so that we get greater investment in housing and supportive services as a way of improving health and reducing health care costs in the future. Well, th that is very exciting to hear. And it strikes me as you talk that the mindset that you have about the connections between health and housing are exactly what we want to cultivate throughout the country, so that everybody sees the opportunity uh, that you've seen. But along those lines, we know that getting everyone to the place where they recognize the potential impact that their policies have on health is a process. And it's not just a policy process, but it's a cultural process, because we are trying to change decades old attitudes that people have around policy and around health. As you've come to, to HUD uh, as a new leader uh, at the department, how did you go about shifting how people thought within the department so that you could accelerate your progress on building health into housing policies? Well, you know, the good news is that <clears throat> there are a lot of folks uh, who have been working at HUD uh, for years that, that have been passionate about this work, especially folks who have worked on, on these programs that HUD has had, whether it's been um, lead hazard control grants or the other ones that I mentioned. And so really it's been kind of a, a renewal of a passion or, or focus like any organization. You know, when you have a focus from the top, that makes a difference. And there is already buy-in, I think, throughout HUD. Um, now, I will say that before I came to HUD, I was a mayor. I was the mayor of San Antonio, Texas. Hopefully some of y'all, uh, I see we have some San Antonians in the house. I'm sure the Spurs are going to win the NBA championship, but <laughs> we'll save that for another day. And, um, you know, I like to tell this story of, uh, because I know that many of y'all work in local communities. You know, in D.C., we, we often think of things from the federal government perspective, but really the action happens in local communities. And um, I got elected uh, to the city council in San Antonio when I was 26 years old. And I remember having this neighborhood association budget meeting a few months after I got elected. We were getting ready to do our fiscal year 2002 budget. And uh, after the meeting was over, a woman came up to me and she told me, she asked me if we could take some budget money and invest it in uh, sidewalks in her neighborhood. And she told me that that the, the neighborhood had gone, or the, the couple of streets she was talking about that she and her mother lived on had gone decades without getting sidewalks. And she had an urgent plea for money for sidewalks because her mother had diabetes and her doctor had asked her to walk more, you know, to get the blood circulation going. Um, but it wasn't possible for her, her mother to walk safely because the neighborhood didn't have any sidewalks. And there were packs of dogs that, you know, presented a, a danger to folks that were walking the neighborhood. And for me, you know, at that very early stage of my public policy uh, career, it impressed upon me how all of these things are connected. You know, I was just thinking about spending money for sidewalks just for the physical purpose of having sidewalks. I wasn't thinking about the impact that has on people's health 
Um, you know, the, the connection also to transit opportunities or economic development opportunities and health, that all of these things are connected. And so now, as somebody who has the chance at HUD to make a difference, that's how I think about it, that what we do in housing can also link up and have a profound impact on people's health. For all of those kids that are living in our public housing units, and 40% of the folks who live in public housing are children, many of them minority, um, we know that the difference between them doing well in school and not doing well in school can be whether they're healthy or sick, whether they've had an eye exam or a dental exam or not. And so there are all of these ways that we think about improving life outcomes, and so many of them run through whether or not uh, somebody's getting the medical attention, the health care that they need. It's absolutely true. I mean, what you're saying reminds me of something that we often say, which is that health is a river that runs through everything. And the it's question true. is, do we choose to recognize it or not? Your story about the sidewalks I find very interesting. And it reminded me, in fact, also of a group of students who came to our office um, down in DC just a few days ago. And they came because they, they heard about the call to action on walking and walkable communities that we had issued recently. And I thank you so much for your support of that call to action as well. We saw the picture of you walking as well, <coughs> which we really love. <laughs> Thanks for posting that on Twitter. But one of the things that they told us when we came is that they wanted to get more kids walking in the country, and they thought it could be a powerful tool for reducing childhood obesity. But when I asked them how many of you feel unsafe walking in your neighborhood, over half the hands shot up in the room. And that was really striking to me. And I think what you uncovered in San Antonio, the fact that there are physical barriers, there are safety-related barriers to walking and to activity, uh, that's a real thing that a lot of communities are facing. And the question I had for you is, for the leaders out here in the audience, who are leaders at a local level and a state level, who recognize what you're talking about as being important, that of, that of building and focusing on infrastructure as a, a key determinant for health, the challenge they have voiced to me is that they have a hard time convincing other sectors that they have an important role to play. They have a hard time going to their local elected leaders and convincing them to move beyond the siloed way that funding yeah. exists right now and to recognizing that we actually have to use funds that might be earmarked for transportation to actually help health uh, and that there's a real connection there. So as someone who has been a former mayor, who has uh, worked with uh, many of the folks in this room or folks in positions like theirs, what advice would you give them on how they can engage other sectors in working on health? Yeah, well, my number one piece of advice <clears throat> for anybody would be that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. <laughs> so keep at it. Uh, it doesn't matter what level of government it is. Um, it makes a difference to have loud, effective advocates. Th those two things go together. You can't just be loud. You've got to be effective <clears throat> and smart. But secondly, <laughs> which all of y'all are, <clears throat> But secondly, um, yeah, I, I believe that one of the lasting legacies of the Obama administration will be that in cities across the United States, um, our approach has challenged local communities to mirror this, this work that is breaking through silos. So for instance, one of the early efforts that I recognized when I was mayor was the Obama's Sustainable Communities effort, which was EPA working with the Department of Transportation, working with HUD thinking about uh, uh, the environment around neighborhoods, uh, access to transit, and quality of housing. Promise neighborhoods, promise zones, choice neighborhoods are other examples of that work. This place-based work that is breaking across silos. So if I had another piece of advice for local advocates and folks who want to integrate a concern for health into that, uh, you know, I would try going up to your local elected officials, whether it's a council member or the mayor or a, a county commissioner or county supervisor in Texas, we call them the county judge, um, and ask them to have one meeting, start off with one meeting where all of the people from the different silos are there represented. The executive director of the health system in your local community with the uh, executive director of the transit system with the community college system, the school district. That's what we did in San Antonio. And I found, first of all, it is surprising how few times those policymakers actually get in the room at the same time, not for you know just listening to somebody talk or at a speech or a ceremony, ribbon cutting, 
but to actually think through, okay, what are y'all doing over here? And this is what we're doing here in this neighborhood, and this is what y'all are doing. So how can we think about combining these efforts? It's amazing how quickly uh, the organizations um, spot what each other is doing and then what the possibilities are for collaboration. And I think that the easiest way is, is, is to start at a neighborhood by neighborhood level, but soon enough, people start thinking at a system-wide level about how they can collaborate. And that, might, that may sound simple or, or in some ways naive, but the fact is that you do have to start somewhere. And the best way is to get those policymakers in the same room to think about the possibilities of collaboration. And it's true that it may be difficult, you know, if, if one nonprofit leader comes up and asks the mayor to do that. Uh, but if many folks from the community band together and ask them to do that, that will happen because your ask is not that big of an ask to begin with. And then it's the follow-up to that that I think can make a difference. Well, that is valuable advice. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. You touched on, on funding a little bit. I know we had talked about this a bit earlier. But I wanted to also get your thoughts on how we get from where we are now with very siloed funding at state, local, and federal levels. Mm -hmm. How do we move from that to a more flexible shared source of funding where we recognize that dividing up funding between heart disease and diabetes or between sometimes between health and housing can sometimes have counterintuitive or counter un unintended effects? You know, one of the things that we're looking forward to uh, that we're, we're requesting money for, for instance, um, to demonstrate this link between health and housing and the savings that we can achieve is uh, what's called a Section 202 demonstration project. So Section 202, for those of y'all that are familiar with housing, refers to elderly housing. You know, we have for years at HUD supported, invested in elderly housing. We don't invest in new Section 202 housing units, unfortunately, right now, although I believe that we need to because the fastest growing demographic out there are actually people, baby boomers turning 65 and actually folks turning 85 and older. However, we have a modest request in this year's budget to do a demonstration project that would allow us to study the impact of um, elderly housing with strong supportive health services so that we can show, hopefully, according to the research, um, very concretely that investing on the front end will make a difference on the back end in saving Medicaid and Medicare dollars and get folks in Congress to think differently about how they allocate resources. Um, we think that by, by investing it early, you can save money later. And I think that the, the same thing goes for just uh, silos within the health field. Um, that's where our approach of using public housing communities as a strong sort of platform for investing where people live, we think, is a powerful way to do that. And whether the challenge is uh, kids that may have a vision issue or have elevated blood lead levels, um, or elderly residents uh, who have diabetes or another affliction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, that's very exciting to hear because I think one thing you know uh, well is that the house for so many people is the foundation for their health. It's where their health begins. And I think one thing we're seeing more and more with the evolution of medical technology as well is that a shift toward delivering more care and more prevention where people live. Uh, so this is very exciting to hear. You know, we're about a year out from the end of the Obama administration. Uh, it's going to be a time, obviously, of a lot of transition. And even though there's a lot to do between now and then, I wonder if you could fast forward with us about 12, 13, 14 months down the line when you were writing a memo to the next Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. And I'm curious, what are you telling them the next frontiers are when it comes to housing and health? What are you asking them or recommending that they focus on? It's a great question. and. Um you know, oddly enough, having only 15 months left in the administration uh, is, is a, a blessing in disguise because it makes you focus, prioritize. So, for instance, uh, one of the things that we're very proud of is that 612 public housing authorities, 20% of the public housing authorities out there, have voluntarily gone smoke-free. Uh, and, you know, we, and, uh, you know, stay tuned because we want to make more progress than that in the future. Uh, and hopefully I'll have a good report for the next HUD secretary on that. Um, but we want to extend that 
to issues related to asthma, uh, to other issues that especially young people, children face. So I hope that one of the things I'll be proud of then uh, and write in the memo is the progress that we've made on that end and then what I believe the next HUD secretary should do to extend that work essentially with the goal of, of you know, let's say that at least 85% um, of the children who live in public housing, you know how we talk about people being kinder ready, mm -hmm. but oftentimes that's a focus on the academics, that, that we would focus on the health, that we would set a goal that 85% of those kids or so on and so forth, I haven't set the goal yet, but that we would think about it in the same way that um, by the time they enter school, then not only are they academically ready, but health-wise they're also ready. That is great to hear. Sure. That's very exciting. Well, that, that is fantastic to hear. And, you know, in making sure we all know that kids are so important as an area, a place to focus because if we can give them a strong start to their life in terms of health, education, and other, you know, core elements that build and give them a foundation for growth later on, that we will be so much better off later as opposed to focusing downstream. I know that you were here in you know, in Chicago, not just for this, but also to make uh, some other announcements related to an announcement the president made earlier today. And I was wondering if you could sh uh, speak a little bit about the exciting announce announcement that you shared earlier today with the public. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so earlier today, the president uh, announced a package of reforms related to criminal justice reform. Uh, as you all know, folks on both sides of the aisle, from the Koch brothers to uh, folks on the left side of the scale, uh, have made supporting criminal justice reform a priority, and the President has actually been leading on this for quite a while. Today, he announced several initiatives from, for instance, uh, a ban the box initiative so that federal employers and federal contractors cannot, at the outset, on an application, ask whether somebody has a criminal history. Now, in the process, they can discover that later, but at the beginning, they can't X somebody out just because you have a criminal history. Uh, and two of the, of the provisions that he announced actually relate to housing. Uh, one of them says um, to public housing authorities that you cannot have a one-strike policy, so that if a resident has you know, one conviction, one mistake, that that's it, they're out. Uh, and secondly, it says that a public housing authority cannot use the fact that somebody has been arrested or has an arrest record to X them out of housing or kick them out of housing if they're already... Um, and then uh, we also announced a partnership with the Department of Justice that in 18 different public housing communities will provide resources to offer expungements for people between the ages of 18 and 24 who are public housing residents or family members of public housing residents in that age group so that if they have, if they committed a crime and did their, their time um, but their record is expungeable under that state's law that they can get those records at Sponge so that they can have a second chance to get good employment and housing and so forth. Yeah. So, you know, just like we believe that, that uh, housing and health are linked, I believe that this is something that is linked as well, housing and criminal justice reform, and all of them come together uh, in the goal of having communities that are healthier, uh, that are on a path to opportunity, and more likely to achieve their dreams. Absolutely. Well, that is very exciting to hear about. And this is a topic that has come up at APHA over these last uh, day, day to two days. Many people here recognize the impact that our criminal justice system and that we, the ways we've handled uh, various issues, including and particularly uh, drugs, have actually impacted people's health. And in some cases had seriously deleterious effects on people's health and communities' health uh, for, for the long term. Sure. So this is very exciting to hear about. You know, in the remaining few minutes that we have, I wonder if we could switch uh, to, to a more personal note. And, you and I have had the chance to, to chat before. I, I know that you have a wonderful wife and two fantastic kids, uh, Karina and Christian. And one thing I was curious about is how is being, uh, being a dad, uh, given, especially given that your kids are, are young, how has being a father impacted how you approach public policy? Yeah, less sleep than I used to get. <laughs> uh, my wife and I have a 10-month-old little boy, and I just got over a cold that he gave me, by the way. <laughs> I was bragging that he had not gotten sick the way that my daughter used to get sick all the time. She's six. Um, no, I think that in terms of, 
in terms of public policy, I, I think most folks would agree, and it, it's not groundbreaking, people have said it over and over, but I believe that it's true that, that when you have children, uh, it, it changes your perspective a little bit, that you're not just thinking about uh, the next couple of years, that you're thinking about uh, how you can create a better community, a better nation for many years to come and generations to come. And, um, and that's what being a father has reminded me about. I think just today compared to 10 years ago, um, that when I think about what we're doing, what we're up to in terms of policy, I just think about it much further out. Mm -hmm. and, and that comes in part from being a dad and caring about what kind of world my children are gonna live in and their children are gonna live in. And um, so it's a, a real blessing, that kind of perspective that they give you. And something you mentioned struck me, that having kids has encouraged you and pushed you to think even more long-term, not just about what we do tomorrow, but what are we doing for the next generation. That strikes me in particular because we, we live in a time where people seem very driven by the short term. And whether that's, and we see that in the news cycle, we see that in politics, we see that in so many uh, lanes of life. How do we get people to think beyond the short term? How do we get them to think about that longer term approach that we need to take if we ultimately want to build a stronger country? Yeah, I mean, that, that is a great question. And I know that uh, those of y'all who are in public health and who practice medicine um, particularly know that, uh, that this is very tough. Uh, think about all the times, for instance, my grandmother had diabetes. Mm -hmm. And um, I could, we could never get her to stop you know, eating the tamales and <laughs> drinking beer and you know, eating pan dulce. And, um, all of us in our lives in so many different ways have a very short term um, perspective and I do think that today people's attention span generally has become shorter and shorter. Um, I think that the best way that we can get folks to think differently is appealing to their self-interest and reminding them that that um, you know what they do now will have consequences for later and then when it comes to policy it is, it is so important to be able to demonstrate outcomes and use research effectively um, to inform public policy. And so to us at HUD, in the way that we think now, outcomes and being able to demonstrate that is like gold. And the more that we can integrate that into the conversation, I think the better chance there is that policymakers will think of the long haul and not just about you know, today's budget or how they're gonna look, what they're gonna be able to show their constituents tomorrow, but instead about the long-term impact that their decisions are gonna have uh, for the community that they represent. Mm. And this ties very much into the, the next question I wanted to ask you, which is about leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, you have been uh, a rising star for, for many years now, and I don't say that to embarrass you or make you blush, but I think it's something you know. Although you make me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're the only one who's younger than I am. So you, I should be telling you that. Yeah. Oh, well, that's very kind of you. We are very close in age, I know that. <laughs> have you even hit 40 yet? In, in a couple of years, I will. Uh, see? <laughs> <laughs> then I should be giving you the compliment. I'm 41 already. <laughs> I feel old. Well, just to say, you know, as you mentioned, you were elected when you were 26 years of age. That's right. You did so much when you were mayor. You had the decade of downtown that you initiated, which wasn't just about policy, but about getting people to think about their environment and their neighborhoods in a new way. Uh, you've obviously, you know, you're now Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. You've done so much else in your life. You have a brother who's also an extraordinary uh, superstar as well. I've heard you tell your personal story before, and it is such an in incredible story to see uh, how you went from, from very little, like early in your life, to so much uh, later in life. But one thing I'm curious about is you've obviously learned leadership lessons along the way, and especially being that we are at uh, a conference with people who are leaders on a local level and a state level and on a federal level who are looking to, be, to get to that next level of leadership, what lessons would you have uh, to offer them? What pearls have you gained that you would like to share with the audience here? Um, I mean, a couple of things. Um, first of all, and based on my experience as somebody that was in local government and then was mayor, now HUD secretary, I know, you know leadership is so varied in different contexts. Um, but I would say, number one, um, never underestimate the value of listening to the people that you're serving and getting a lot of great ideas from them 
Sometimes it takes translation into, in my case, public policy or health policy, but oftentimes being a great listener is key to being an effective leader. Um, the second thing I would say is that I have always believed that a strong part of leadership starts in the vision that someone has for what they believe ought to be accomplished. And that's, I think that's especially true in public service um, because uh, people want to know where you want to take the community. And that vision, if it includes the ideas of the people that you represent and it's long term and it's compelling, I think that, that begins effective leadership. Um, in so much as leadership is having that vision that includes people's ideas and then getting folks to work toward that vision. Uh, so, you know, start off with listening with folks, listening to folks, and then having a sense of where you want things to go in the future. Um, to me, that's always been part and parcel of leadership. Well, those are fantastic lessons. I, I know that we, I wish we had more time with you, but I'm getting the sign that we've got to wrap up to get you on a plane. Uh, right. to head out of town, so we will do that. But uh, before we end, I did want to, uh, to just recognize one more person who has been uh, a real leader from the beginning in the National Prevention Council, and that's my predecessor, former Surgeon General Dr. Regina Benjamin, who's here with us today. <laughs> Dr. Benjamin was the first chair of the National Prevention Council. Uh, and I've stepped into her shoes, trying to fill rather big shoes, but doing my best. Uh, but thank you so much, Dr. Benjamin, for all your leadership in, in establishing the Council, the National Prevention Strategy, uh, and for giving us a platform on which to build. Uh, and Secretary Castro, I just want to say again how excited we are about the, the work that you are doing on HUD and the connections you're making between housing and health. We are trying to do this, as you know, across the federal government, and we've already had great cooperation from many other agencies with Department of Transportation, for example, they've been a great partner on the walking initiative. They've been working on safe streets and the idea of complete streets for, for quite some time now. And so we found areas of synergy with them. With Secretary Jewell at the Department of Interior, uh, she is passionate about health and about using the national parks as a place to promote both physical activity and good nutrition. So like this, we want to build more and more collaborations. But certainly the work that you are doing as HUD at HUD stands out as a great example uh, for all of the departments. And I thank you so much for your great leadership and all the contributions you've made. Thank you. All right, let's please join me in giving Thanks a hand to Secretary Castro. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.